So welcome everybody. Welcome to the STC Instructional Design Learning Special Interest Group Workshop Series. Today is installment two of our learning about Addie. Um, today, Jennifer Good is going to teach us about Addie, who she is, who is she, why instructional designers should care. Um, if you want to get caught up for what we learned in session number one, just uh, go to the YouTube link that's either on the sign up page or will be in the email that you get. Today, uh, we're going to dive deeper. Last time we learned about sort of connecting with our uh, user population, you know, basically our audience. And today we're going to get in deeper to what is Addy, you know, how do we uh, analyze design uh i've i've forgotten them all so <laughs> you have your work cut out for you jennifer so anyway we can't wait to hear from you and everybody this is a time where we put our hands together and welcome back jennifer good well thanks so much vicky for the warm welcome and uh, if you can hear me give me a thumbs up just so i know that i'm not talking into deep space fantastic <laughs> wonderful i love that um, yes, we, um, uh, you guys had me and welcomed me back in November and you had me back. So, wow, what a privilege to be invited back for a second installment. We talked a lot last time about, um, if you were interested in getting into instructional design, how could you kind of pivot or parlay into the field from the technical writing side? And I hope that kind of piqued your interest and I gave you some homework, which we'll talk about, and Vicki has already alluded to, uh, with about with with regards to analyzing your audience. So we're going to work that into today's conversation. But we are we're going to go deeper today and talk a little bit more about Addie. And of course, I just put a pun on it. it who is she? Uh, we we hear about Addie. Maybe sometimes we don't. Um, I was working with somebody some training um, not not far um, too long ago, and it was. Um, an instruction, excuse me, he was a technical writer and a documentation manager, and he had to frequently interface with somebody who was an instructional designer. And he said, they keep talking about Addy. And he had no clue until he had attended my training about what that was. And he said, now I have so much more context. I have so much more understanding about why uh, they kept coming back to Addy and why Addy was brought up in so many conversations. And so he said that, you know, knowing some basics, even if you're not a full-fledged instructional designer or procedure analyst or something in your, in your uh, job related to instruction, you can still gain some, some traction out of this content. So regardless of where you've come from, regardless of why you're here, I'm delighted that you joined us today. And I'm just so excited to talk to you a little bit about the process that instructional designers call Addy. And so let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to do today. We're going to go back to instructional design just to catch you up and give you the Cliff Notes version. That's going to date me. Um, but the Cliff Notes version of instructional design. What did we talk about last time in a nutshell? How did we get to this point? And then we're going to pivot into what is Addy and why is Addy a reliable process for ID work? And I'll say ID and instructional design interchangeably. Um, that's, that's just what I'm talking about. Instructional design is ID work. Um, and then I've brought some tools along to support your steps in the Addy process. So now if you haven't done this, this is your cue to go out to your invite from Eventbrite, um, the messaging that Vicki has sent out, and there is a handout packet for today's session. And we're going to go through each of the tools that's linked in that handout packet. You've got some time, so no rush, um, but we will be referring to it. And I invite you to at least pull it up in another screen or another window. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about how we can use these throughout the Addy process. And hopefully it will just bolster uh, your ability to apply Addy in your workplace and in the work you do for instructional systems. Okay, if we haven't met, I see so many familiar faces in the room, but I see a couple of new folks too. So I just want to introduce myself briefly. I'm Jennifer Good. I have 20 plus years in, in learning and development. So I've done everything from technical writing to instructional design to learning program management and consulting 
uh, with organizations about how to solve their problems, how to measure their learning, and what kind of training needs they have. Um, I've worked in lots of industries, government, military, uh, tech, IT, and higher ed. So uh, what you can assume from all of this is just, I just love learning. Um, and I told and shared folks with folks last time, I like it internally because I it, it qualifies all these things. Um, for me, personal growth, I love the challenge of, of learning something new. It keeps me on my toes. But externally, I feel like I'm being a good team player. I'm supporting that continuous improvement. I'm um, doing professional development that will get me somewhere else. Um, it helps others, it solves problems. So I think that um, if you're here today, I think probably some of these reasons could be said of you too. You're here on a Saturday, bless you. <laughs> you're learning on a Saturday and I love it. Uh, and hopefully you do too. So kudos to you for showing up um, and, and coming here to learn. I think instructional design is a great field for people who love learning. It's what we do. It's what we promote. It's what we uh, try to bring about in others. And so today I'm going to really quickly recap a story of, of what instructional design is. I'm going to speed through the ADDIE process once and give you the same example that we talked about last time from a project that I started beginning to end for the Air Force. And then we're going to take a deep dive into ADDIE. So, um, I'm gonna start off here with this slide, what's instructional design? And we defined it last time as creating targeted learning experiences and in the hopes that we're helping them create or perform better on the job, um, helping them solve a problem or even use a product. So it could be anything from a user manual you get with your new Apple device. It could be a new set of procedures that helps you save time in your production or it could be something that helps you troubleshoot a problem that you um, are encountering with your device, your process, your computer, uh, et cetera. So instructional design, if you can't see already, is a really broad field. Um, it is a niche within kind of the tech comm field, and that's how we kind of situate ourselves within the Society for Technical Communication. Um, but you know, we in and of ourselves are really a big field, and then we feed into other fields. So we're not exclusively in tech writing, but uh, we certainly have a, a lot of tech writers and a lot of uh, fun associating ourselves with that type of communication, but we're also in the change management industry, uh, we're helping folks change and, and grow and develop their business. We're in the career development phase because as you uh, grow your career, you have to learn and, and, and adapt new skills along the way. And so instructional design has kind of found itself claimed by many because it's just valuable, back to that learning piece, helping people do better work on the job, um, solve their problems and use products. Um, I showed this slide last time. Again, these first few slides you're gonna, if you were here last week, you're gonna have deja vu, but that's all right, right? Um, these are good summaries. So it's instructional because we're teaching, we're focused on learning, we're focused on not just the user, not just the audience, but we call them the learner in this context. And we're focusing on applying that new knowledge immediately. So we're not waiting around um, for five, 10, 15 years for you to use it. This is something that you're trying to use right now to solve a problem. And then design, we're focusing on strong, clear writing, all those visual uh, design elements that we've brought along from our tech comm background or our technical writing background. Maybe you've come from um, graphic design. Um, and we are using all those design elements to make good choices that enhance that learning experience. So um, it, it is a balance of those two concepts, instruction and design. And in the end, like I said, we're trying to produce any number of things, procedures, guidelines, instructional manuals, animations, e-learns. Uh, th this is just the surface level of what we can create with instructional design, because you can find instructions just about anywhere. But these are some of the products that we produce. And like I told you last time, these are some of the tools that are involved. Now, if you're an instructional designer, you're of course not expected to know every one of these. Some of you guys are talented super users though, and you know them all. Um, but just a, a, a slice of what you might expect in word processing or what you might uh, expect in measurement or publication. And I've given you some examples. This is also an aspirational list. If you're thinking that this is something I'd like to get into a little bit deeper, or I'd like to dive in deeper to this process, um, these are just some areas that I could point you to to kind of build your own skill set and learn the technology so that you can be prepared to do the work in that area. 
Okay, so now let's do a quick reintroduction of Addie. Let's talk about who Addie is and how Addie as a process becomes a way of systemically creating a reliable, repeatable, consistent ID framework so that when our work is done, we are able to repeat that process and get um, the similar results and reliable results that actually make uh, change in learning um, serve its purpose in the organization. So let's talk about this. ADDI is an acronym, of course. Uh, ADDI stands for Analyze, Design, Develop, Implement, and Evaluate. And you can see it's a process that's circular. And we talk about that because when you start a new project, you do start with analyze to learn about the audience, learn about the problem, learn about the content you got to create. Then you design a solution, then you develop that solution and actually build the parts. Then you implement it and send it out to the learners and the audiences. And then at the end, you evaluate, and see how you've done. You do that because eventually we anticipate anticipate that it's going to circle back and you're going to continue that process, continue to analyze, continue to, to refine and make it better for future iterations of that training. So that's why it's cyclical. Um, during the analyze phase, um, you are studying what's the problem? <laughs> Who needs what in my organization? What is the big outcome that we're trying to shift or to change from what's currently going on? Where do we desire to be in the future? Uh, what does that gap look like? Who is my audience? Who are my learners? Uh, what is the context to which they're coming uh, to this training? Uh, are they panicked? Are they worried because they just hit a problem and they've got deadlines? Um, have they gotten, gotten new equipment that's been shipped in and they don't know how to use it? Uh, what are the situational contexts? What are the usage contexts? Are they working in a a, a machine shop where it's loud and noisy and very hard to keep up with paper products um, and resources like that. You know, do they have a computer at their ready? These are the things that we want to analyze in the first step of Addy. So I'm going to share with you real briefly that I did some work many years ago with the United States Air Force. And this is the one of the planes that I found one of my projects on. And this is the E-4B and so um, this E-4B plane, there aren't a whole lot of them in the Air Force, but they needed some training for some specialized crew members who worked in the back of the plane. And so I was asking them some of these questions during the analysis phase. In fact, I went out on site uh, to Nebraska and went on a flight, went on a mission with them to see what it was they were doing. And then in the design phase, I actually took the content and research that I had done on site and began to plan delivery strategies. Okay, how could they learn what I just discovered that they need to know? Uh, what kind of format seems appropriate here? What exact content needs to be included here? And what doesn't need to be concluded because, you know, it was covered somewhere else or they already had training on that or they already knew that coming in from job experience. Let's structure that. Let's think about interactions. Let's script it. So how do we present the information in audio or screen format? What kind of graphics do we need? Um, do they need to be interactive graphics so they could try interfacing with the computer systems on a screen instead of on board the plane? And then what would we, how would we lay this out on the screen so it's replicate, replicating the system, replicating the context, replicating the usage that these actual men and women in the Air Force are experiencing when they're on flight. Um, so we might produce things like a storyboard or a script, some layouts, some interaction logic and flow charts. Those types of things are what we produce here. And these are just some other shots to show you um, some of the field work that I did um, along the way. Now, this is an old picture. I did not tell you this last time. This is like 15 years old, no laughing, okay? Um, so our computer, our webcams, like you're thinking that was like an archaic piece of equipment. Yeah, I don't use that now. <laughs> but when I develop now, I use a much faster computer with lots more memory and lots more application uh, strength and breadth because I'm creating and building the audio. I have, um, I have audio equipment like a really nice microphone. I build the graphics in Adobe. Uh, I might use Storyline or Articulate Rise uh, to build an e-learn, might use some slide decks, create handouts, infographics, all these things. I'm actually taking my plan that I designed 
and now I'm building out the pieces. So um, again, we've come a long way <laughs> in the instructional design phase. In implement, we actually deliver the training. So this is where we go out and we say, okay, before we launch it, we wanna do some user testing. We wanna do some DEI and accessibility review. We want to integrate it within the LMS. We might wanna run a pilot program. Um, and then we start whatever measurement we're using and we launch the comms. We say, hey, everybody, we've got your training or you've been assigned training, come to this training. Uh, we launch the program and then we start talking about how we're gonna govern at like, you know, are we going to give badges or credentials for the training? Are we going to, um, are we going to cut off access if people don't? Is it so serious that they have to, to complete the, the training in order to continue their jobs? Um, so some of that governance question comes up during the implementation phase. And then in evaluation, that's where we check the numbers. We run the completion rate. We look at the testing results. We look at performance outcomes. Is it changing the way we had hoped? Um, is it changing the organization, the performance, the culture, the skills, the way we had hoped? Um, do we need to update bad badging status, update records with HR? And then what kind of things could we do to improve this later? So there's a lot of moving parts to watch in the evaluate phase. Um, and again, that brings us back to the beginning because when we have future improvement data, we, we siphon it right back into analysis, check, uh, do a temperature check on the organization, make sure we're still solving for the same problems, make sure we still have the same user population, make sure none of those details are changed and we start the whole cycle over again. So we're back where we began, back at analysis. So analyze, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. That's the big picture introduction of Addy. Again, I know we covered this last time if you were here with us then, but I thought this was a good introduction before we start taking our deep dives. So for the rest of the time, and by my calculations, we have about an hour, so this could be fun. Um, again, you're getting the recording, you've got the handouts. If you need to pop out, pop back in later, whatever you need to do, totally fine. These are little short bursts of activities for us to work on as a group together. Um, but if you're watching this recording later, you can follow along, download the handouts and do them uh, on your own. Uh, and then I really hope that maybe you'll be able to use some of these tools uh, back on the job and when you're working. Some of these tools I've found very valuable over the years. Um, and there's, a, there's just a myriad more. So please don't feel that this is an exhaustive list. I've just selected some of the most useful, fun, and straightforward ones that I could share with you today that might really give you some traction on your next ID project. Okay, so here is our reminder graphic. This is page one in your handouts. So if you got your handouts, you've printed them out or you've got them up on a separate screen or you know split, uh, split your monitor, this is the first page. So what we're gonna do is follow the blue box through this process. And I've kind of given you a cheat sheet here so that we can remember what is it that we're doing in Analyze? What is it that we're doing in Design? Um, and this will follow along uh, at, in our discussion and guide our activities. Just as a, a, a side note here, Addy is pretty universally, I didn't say this earlier, Addy is pretty universally well known in the field. Um, most instructional designers who have um, worked in the field or taken courses in the field will know and talk about Addy. But there are other models and processes that are really popular as well. And some of them, if you really kind of look at them structurally, they mimic the ADDIE process. They do some sort of analysis. They might group design and development together um, and then they launch or, and then they evaluate or measure. But you'll see this same kind of iterative pathway. So I don't want that to distract you or to worry you if you say, well, my organization doesn't actually use ADDIE. Um, that's okay. Sometimes they call it something different. They might have different steps, names, um, or the pathway may, may look or appear different initially, but when you dig down in, typically we're following the same sort of pathway where we analyze the, the situation, develop a design or solution, implement the solution, and then, and then measure it and track it. So just wanted to say that out loud. Okay, we're going into the deep dive for analysis. So let's talk about what we do when we analyze. This is where you're going to ask yourself uh, if you don't have access to stakeholders or ideally your stakeholders, your subject matter experts. You might want to screen cap this, take a picture of it, 
these are some great interview questions where you can say, hey, what's working for you? What's not working? Um, and then ask a little bit deeper, what's, what's not working and why? Um, and maybe tell them, ask them to tell you a story of how the problem first came to be and how you realized it was a problem and what it's impacting in the organization. Like, is it causing you guys to lose money? Are you losing employees? I hope not. Um, are you losing, um, are you losing time um, because of this problem? Like, what are the after effects? And we're going to star those after effects because in the end, we want to return results to them in that language. So those results, um, when we say we're saving you this much time, we're retaining employees by this many, we're saving you this much money. Those are what we're identifying as the pain points now, and they become the rewards at the end of this process. So make sure you ask that question up front. Um, you might want to ask them a little bit more about what kind of barriers they have to fixing this problem. Have they tried anything? What's gotten in the way of some easy fixes? Um, a lot of times people will manifest problems by complaining about something or bringing up issues in, in team meetings. Um, so what is it that people are really asking for? What, are, what kind of concerns do they have and who are they? Is it the, is it the engineering team? Is it the, the management team? Is it the uh, project managers, like who is it that that's complaining or voicing concerns along the way that we want to talk to them too? Um, what ideas have been suggested in the past? It's always nice to know what people are suggesting. It may or may not be what you recommend in the end, but that's okay. And then who needs to change what they're doing or how they're doing it? Uh, you can ask things like, well, what does this group of people already know and what don't they know? How do they feel about this problem? Um, people can, people's feelings actually matter in instructional design, and we need to know those up front. Um, if you've ever been in training and you didn't want to be there, um, you were mad that you were being made to go to this training because you felt like you already knew it, um, that training needs to be kind of customized to account for that kind of feeling and to show its value. And so we can, can um, accommodate different attitudes and feelings in our approach and how we show the rewards or potential rewards of taking the training to our users. And so it's important if everybody's mad about this and nobody wants to go to training, it's really important as training developers or as instructional designers that we know that upfront. So I always ask, how's everybody feeling about this? Are people mad or people really engaged and really want a solution? Um, if a lot of times I'll, I'll ask this question and people say, oh no, they are dying for training. Please provide something. And that's such an exciting experience right? when everybody wants to come to training, wants to learn the solution and wants to do it together. So in the end, after you've collected this and much more information, you can continue to dig and ask questions through those uh, multiple interviews, so stakeholder and subject matter expert uh, interviews. Summarize what you've learned. Put it in a report or a memo format, a slide deck, and share back with the stakeholders what you've heard. Tell them, uh, you know, here's what I know or what I think I know. Does this look accurate? Is, did I capture this correctly from what you've told me? Correct me where I'm wrong. Um, and then say, based on this, I think that we could do X, Y, Z, here's my initial recommendations based on what I'm learning right here. Um, this is uh, a lot of the work that I do in some of my consulting work, people will just bring me on to do this type of work. So if you're a lone ID in your organization, you may have to do all of these steps, but I also want you to hear that there are specialized team members that do just this work as well. They just go out in the organization and when training is requested, they go in and they dig and they um, analyze and they, they uh, design preliminary solutions. So that that could be a calling for you. Like, I really like this investigative work. This is where I like to operate. And that's great. You could be an analyst, a needs analyst. Let me share a couple of things. Let's go to the next page of your handouts. And this is called a fishbone diagram. If you've seen one of these before, clap your hands, wave your um, imaginary zoom, zoom hand, give me some feedback. Um, I would love to see if you've known this, but this is a, um, this is a fishbone diagram. And what it helps us to do is to kind of dissect or fish out the root of the problem. So we start with what a problem is. And sometimes that problem is an actual problem. 
and sometimes it's the perceived problem. And what do I mean by that? A lot of times people are like, well, they just don't know what they're doing. We need training. Like, okay, well, let's back up. How do you know that they need training or what kind of problems are you observing? And so what we're trying to do is say, well, what's the cause? Why do you think that they need training? And ask more questions. And well, what are the factors that led you to think that that's a cause? And then ask what the other causes are. And what we're trying to do is kind of parse this down because what the actual problem is may or may not be what is presented as the problem by the people who are requesting it. Um, and this is where you kind of have to put your thinking cap on. Um, and so this is a great group activity when you're working in a uh, or facilitating like a managerial or a stakeholder or a subject matter expert meeting. You can throw this up on a whiteboard in a conference room. You can put it in a PowerPoint deck slide and um, work with it there. If you've ever used Mural, which is kind of like a, a whiteboard for online collaboration, you can use sticky notes in Mural if you have access to that software. I've done this a lot of ways, but it gets people brainstorming and you can have them do it silently and then fill in uh, with sticky notes or write on the board or put sticky notes down wherever they want and then go back and debrief it and ask questions. Or you can kind of lead them through this and you be the keeper of the the fishbone diagram, if you will. Um, because here's the thing that I want you to know. Training can only address gaps in knowledge, skills, and attitudes. I'm gonna say that again. Training only fixes problems that are related to knowledge, skills, or attitude, to attitudes. I don't know the state capitals. I can take training on that. I don't know how to drive. I can learn a skill to do that. I don't feel confident that this is the best solution. I'm angry about that. I can change an attitude by sharing the background and understanding of why that um, solution has been um, taken. Okay, so Bobby shares that she uses Miro in planning camps for new projects and identifying tasks. Thanks, thanks so much for that recommendation, Bobby. That's a good one to you. So now you think, well, that's fine, but there are other problems, Jennifer. We have other things to address. My fishbone showed me lots of problems. Indeed, when you do an analysis, you're gonna find so many problems because people are really willing to complain. They're willing to tell you everything, but what you need to try to sort through is which types of problems relate to knowledge, a gap in knowledge, like I don't know information, skills, I don't know how to do something, or attitudes, I don't know why this is important, okay? We can train on all those. Now, if you have a change solution, and this is getting into kind of some change management um, and change initiative development, you may very well also have or discover or uncover structural issues like there may not be a person who is positioned to take care of that job and so it's not getting done we might need to restructure the organization um, we might not have the technology or tool available to do something so it could be that they don't have updated software or new equipment that performs this particular gap we may have a procedural issues, then we, we've changed what we do and how we do it, but we haven't updated the procedure so people are still operating in the old way. We might have to update the process or procedure that we're engaging in. We may have communications where we need to iterate some things in some management meetings. We might need to have some channeling uh, with workplace posts or with um, emails, company-wide emails, and, and build that up in one-on-one -on -one conversations there could be communication issues. People just don't know or aren't aware. And it could be managerial issues. Maybe people don't know how to manage this situation or how to adapt with this new context in this new environment. And there's lots of other, lots and lots of other possible problems here, but I'm just giving you some other ones that are really common that you'll encounter. So when you're digging around and doing this fishbone, right? When you're doing this fishbone, you're likely to come up with, oh yes, there's some things that I can do as a training instructional designer. 
There's also some things that I can't do or that I can support. And I know because I have great communication skills and I know all these things about management or um, technology, but that's outside of the realms of what we're going to do when we develop training or when we develop our instructional solution. Okay. So the next slide or the next paper in your handout is to map out what problems did you uncover and let's group the knowledge, list those, let's group the skills, list those, let's group the attitude gaps, list those and everything else we put in the other category. For your training and for the purpose of this Addy presentation that you're attending, you're gonna focus on knowledge, skills and attitudes, okay? Your homework, so, so, so to speak, as the instructional designer is to find other folks in the organization that can help you solve the other problems. You may not be able to have the power or, uh, or importance, prominence, uh, authority to restructure an entire team, okay? Find the person who does. You may not have the authority to order new equipment for everybody, find the person that does. You may not be able to send out company-wide emails, find the person who does. OK, so that's kind of like your other things that are ruminating, that are contributing to this process that I'm now aware about. And I need to put on my to do list. But for my training, I'm going to focus on what we call in the instructional design world, KSAs, knowledge, skills and attitudes. OK, so let's pause and let's do a workshop. OK, so you've got your fishbone diagram and you've got your sorting page. I want you to think of an organizational issue that you've recently experienced, okay? Um, and I want you to use the fishbone diagram and try to find the problems that are at the root of that issue. You might have some causes and contributing factors that you wanna identify, write those in, and you can draw your own. You don't have to use the worksheets per se, it's just a model. Um, jot it down on a piece of paper or sticky notes, see if you can figure this out. Um, and then try to make a list of all the factors that need to change in your organization in order to solve that problem. And then start sorting them based on knowledge, skills, attitudes, and others. So we're going we're gonna to work on that and integrate those two pieces of paper, two uh, handouts, two tools that I shared in the handouts, and try to identify what are the problems that we're experiencing, what are the root causes, and how do we sort them as instructional designers as to what we can actually solve for? So I'll give you, um, give you about five minutes to do that. And if you guys wanna chitter chatter, that's cool. I'm fine with that because some of you may not have an, an issue that you wanna, um, that you can think of right now. Um, but some of you are like, oh yeah, I'm already writing this stuff down. So, all right, I'm gonna start the timer and you guys, um, if you wanna share, jump on. This is open mic moment workshop. So. Let's do that together. Go. Okay, so another tool that we talked about last time that you can use is called a learner persona. Because remember when we're doing you know, all this research, we're the, we're the investigators of the situation, we're doing the analysis work. We're not just analyzing what the problem is or how it's manifesting, but we're also analyzing who are the learners that this is impacting? Who do we have to teach? What do they already know? What do they do on their jobs? What are they confused by? Um, what do they prefer? Where are they? What kind of technology do they have? And so we create something called a learner persona and multiple personas to kind of identify major groups within our audience. And so this is a fact-based research plan whereby we collect data about our learners and then we situate it and we organize it usually into a slide or a graphic so that we can say, hey, these are the people that do this work. They work in this division. These are their typical job descriptions or what they do mainly on a, a, any given day. This, um, this group of people is typically on this maybe MBTI or personality scale. They have these kinds of traits. And in our research, we might have uncovered some direct quotes that we want to include. We might talk about what tools or work situations they work in, uh, what they do when they, when they encounter a dilemma. Do they go to the uh, internal wiki page or internet, or do they turn to Google, or do they go ask managers? Like, what are some things that typically each group of people do? do? And a persona 
typifies a group of people and kind of reduces them down to these characters and they could be they're fake characters they're not any one person in the group but it kind of helps us to say oh this persona would be served um, by our training in this way or we need to meet so and so's this persona's needs in this way and so i've given you some examples screen caps of different personas um, and how they could be formatted but imagine each one is a part of a collection of personas you know we have we have the newbies who just joined the workforce within the last um, 12 months. We have the, the folks who've been here for one to five years. We have the mid-career managers who, who've been here for five to 10 years. And then we have the folks who've been here for more than 10 years. Maybe you break it down that way. Maybe you break it down by job or division. Um, so you guys worked for homework on learning personas. And if you didn't catch that, please go back and watch the recording because I give you some um, some questions and take you through some processes to develop a learning persona. And we kind of ran out of time, but, and it was really kind of hard to do persona homework where you go interview folks uh, or meet with your team to discuss the different learners in your group, your audience. So I said, let's do this for homework. So we're going to pause the recording and talk about our learning persona homework and see who completed it, maybe what you learned and what benefits you got out of the activity. Okay, so like I was saying, we can use personas to kind of bounce our scenarios back, bounce our approaches off of different user groups in our population. And that helps us to see, okay, well, how will this group interact with this device or characteristic or this piece of information? How will this group encounter them? And we try to make sure that those encounters are positive ex learning experience for everybody. Great. Okay, we're not going to spend any more time on learner personas. We're, we're instead going to move on to design. Okay, so let's do a little bit of uh, tooling in the design area. Now, this is where we would write learning objectives. Um, we've already kind of grouped our KSAs for the program. So remember, those are knowledge, skills, and attitudes. We talked about how important those are. We've used our worksheet, our tool to kind of group them. We know what other things we need to pass on or coordinate with other groups in the other category, but we're gonna focus now on the K, S, and A's of that worksheet, okay? That KSA's on that tooling. Um, and we're gonna write learning objectives. And a learning objective is simply a statement that says, at the end of this training, if all goes well, and everybody gets what they're supposed to out of this, what will they be able to do about this knowledge gap, about this skill gap, about this attitude? And we, we try to quantify those. We try to give some descriptors. So a really, really well-written learning objective will have four parts. It'll identify who, who the learner is. And sometimes it's just the learner. Sometimes it's like the HR, the HR department, or you can get really specific, um, the, the executive team. And so you can talk about that. The condition is under what circumstances are they going to be performing? So given certain tools or given a situation or given um, a scenario, what will they do? So under what constraints or under what condition will they be operating when we're looking to see if they know this information or they've learned the skill or they've developed this attitude? And then we want to kind of identify an observable action because in the end, we're going to need a measurable outcome for that action. So they'll be able to um, complete a procedure without, without error. They'll be able to calculate net profit without error. They'll be able to conduct a procedure in a simulator with 90% accuracy. Now, what those are is those are observable things that I can use to attest that, yep, they've checked the box. They know what we've taught them. And I can observe it or test it or capture it some way. And I can measure to what extent they either passed or they failed. OK, and they need to go back and learn more, because if you calculate net profit um, and you've got errors, then you're not ready to do that accounting work on a full-time basis. So let's let's send you back. Let's give you some more examples, some more training, and see if we can develop those knowledge and skills in order to be able to get you to be able to give in a calculator and an income statement that you calculate net profit without error, right? Um, and so you can kind of see some examples here. I'll share my slides with Vicki afterwards and she can distribute them to everybody. Um, but these are some models. And I love the practice of having four pieces because it identifies who we're talking about, 
what conditions they're working under, um, and what we need to support when we're testing them. And then what we will observe, observable is because we need to actually be able to observe it or capture it or test it or measure it. And then to what extent is passing or I hate to say failing, but needs more, needs more work, <laughs> okay? Once we have those knowledge object, uh, learning objectives and things for our knowledge, skills, and abilities, or knowledge, skills, and attitudes, then we start moving into content and we start organizing that content. So we're going to design a learning experience for the audience. When I went back and uh, did some of that military work with the Air Force, a lot of it was upfront giving them facts, that's the knowledge. But then I also had to train them on the skills of how to use the piece of equipment to determine the numbers that they needed the equipment to tell them for their jobs. So I gave them the information and the, the procedures up front, but then I developed an interactive module that was a simulator and it worked just like the one on the aircraft did. And so they could move the controls, push the buttons just like they could. And that was a learning experience. Could they mess up or break the equipment on the plane by using the simulator? Of course not. They weren't even on the plane. They were training on a laptop computer, right? So um, that experience, though, allowed them to mess up, allowed them to do really well and grow their skills so that when they did get on the aircraft, we could have already confirmed based on some testing or activities or scenarios that, yes, they knew what they were doing. They could do it accurately to whatever the measurement of passing was, and they were ready to go work on the real aircraft and do that. So that was the experience that I crafted during the design phase. So we wanna make sure at the end of this design phase and throughout really, that you're sharing that feedback with your, your stakeholders. Hey, this is what I'm thinking. Do you think this would work? Here's why I'm making these decisions and what I think this will give us in this scenario. So I've got a learning plan on the next handout in your packet. We're gonna kind of develop a learning plan. You might hear this called as a solution blueprint or a learning blueprint or a course outline, but essentially what it is, is a hierarchy, an outline, and you can structure it any way you want. I'm just doing this visually also because it allowed me to utilize one piece of paper and one page instead of multiple. But if you think about it as a hierarchy, we have a unit of learning and we've kind of grouped things that are hierarchically or chronologically related. And we're going to have lessons or subcomponents within that unit that we're going to share. And then inside each lesson, we're gonna have little pieces or modules of information. It could be a video or it might be some web text or it might be um, an activity or a case study or an, a classroom activity or fill in the blank. It depends on what kind of training you're developing, right? But what we're trying to do is provide a structure that's chronologically um, understandable and appropriate but also introduces the content in the right order. So that like we were talking about earlier, we introduce that big why up front and share the instructional information details first so that then they can build upon that and use the information and apply them as skills later. So you kind of have to kind of put these pieces that we've discovered through our fishbone exercise and our, um, our worksheet where we did the, the grouping of KSAs. Now we're trying to kind of group them and organize them align that complementary information and think about how would we creatively share this information to get them to develop that. So, oh, and at the end, see that big thing at the very end, that's assessment. And that's just measurement, that's testing. Um, it might not be testing per se, like taking a written test. In training, if you're giving training, um, when I stop and I ask you guys to share, um, and see if you're getting it, that's a form of assessment. I'm looking to see if what you're doing and what you're saying and what you're processing in our activities is in fact indicators that you've done something well. Now, don't anybody stop participating because of this, okay? <laughs> but just I just want you to think of assessment as really broadly uh, trying to get a gauge on whether or not the learner is getting what you've taught them. So you can have assessment throughout. That's why it's kind of through it all across the whole thing. You can have it at the end of every lesson, at the end of every module, you can have it at the end of the whole unit, um, but you wanna constantly be checking in to see if your learner's getting what you think that they should be getting. So we're gonna have a design workshop and in a moment we're gonna pause the recording. So if you have been following along with your own scenario, this is the point in the design workshop 
where you would create a list of topics that you want to cover, organize them into some sort of unit lesson module hierarchy, and then brainstorm creative ways that we might engage our audience within each topic. And then identify strategies again about how you might measure or see, uh, check in with your audience to see if they're retaining the content that you're teaching. So we're gonna pause here. All right, we're gonna go through these next three phases pretty quickly and then I'm gonna end with an offer for you. And you're gonna think about this and hopefully join us next time. So develop is when we go through and we plan the production needs. Once we have our sign off from our subject matter experts and stakeholders, we have our schedule. We are going to map out, okay, I've got to create some graphics. I've got to create some assessments, some quizzes, or some interactive scenarios or simulations. I've got to create some PowerPoint slides. I've got to create some videos. And we need to plan out how are we going to produce all this. Uh, if you're working on a team, you need to assign team members, graphic designers, writers, writers artists, um, audio technicians to lead those production efforts. And then start now planning what that feedback and monitoring system is, because when we develop some of these things, sometimes we have to build those monitoring systems inside. So if you're using something like XAPI, which is how we track like how far a user has gotten in a course or played in a video or what whatnot, what their answers are, then we have to kind of build that in as we go. And of course, we keep our stakeholders in line. Here's a development tracker though that I've used for some courses that I've developed. We would have a unit. And then we have our lesson. So this is the first unit getting started. I don't have any less, I don't have any lessons, but we would have the, the lessons and then resource IDs. I would record a video. Who's my project manager? Where's that video element live in development? Where's the raw file? Where are the MP4 files? And then what status are we in? It might be something like it's in development, it's in planning, it's in uh, scripting, it's in review one, it's in development, it's in review two and editing, it's in publication, it's released, you know, whatever that is. Then we release it to our production team. How long is that going to take learners to get through? Like we're planning for a two minute video. Oh, it ended up being two minutes and 30 seconds. So they've got the actual time. Um, and that helps us to understand how long it will take our typical users to go through something. It helps us also to plan, hey, we've got a 30 hour course, we need to cut down. Um, so we can cut it down and, and kind of do some estimates that way. But I've given you a copy of this in your packet. We're not going to do this this time, but we can, if you want to try to use this or replicate a version of this for your own use, I highly recommend it for, for managing your instructional projects. All right, then we get to implement. This is where an implement, we're conducting that right before we launch. We do that user and accessibility testing. Um, we conduct a pilot program, maybe just to see if it works with our first 15 participants and then get that feedback, get all the kinks ironed out, and then launch it to the whole system, the whole organization. We launch that program. Then we start monitoring user interactions and feedback. And if we have problems along the way, then we start troubleshooting those. It's really important at this phase to go ahead and get in the pattern and the frequency of meeting with your stakeholders so that you can say, hey, we've got We've got, we're already at 40% completion and we're only two days in. That would be amazing if we got it that fast. Um, but, you know, things like that. What are our testing results? What are our indicators? But start having those conversations as soon as you launch. And then the final one is evaluate. And evaluation, again, did start when we implemented because um, we are evaluating what is the user feedback? What are they getting? Are they having problems accessing something or they, are saving something? Or do they think this training is great? We're monitoring that. We're tracking completions and activity logs. Did they get hung up on a video? Is a video not playing or loading correctly? Um, we're monitoring user interactions and feedback in case there's any red flags or anything that we need to address right away, as opposed to later on during the revision process. Again, troubleshooting those problems all along the way. And then identifying areas for improvement and planning future releases. So again, we're continuing those meetings with the stakeholders throughout this process. You know, you can have a different time period, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, whatever makes sense for your training program rollout. Um, but we're also scheduling that meeting so that we can understand, okay, the next time we launch this for next year's training, we need to have some lessons learned so that we can incorporate those into improvements for next year. So we had schedule those meetings. Um, you may have heard about Kirkpatrick's evaluation model. But these are four levels that we typically hear about and use in practice, reactionary, 
um, which is like, did you like the training? Was the training room nice and, and comfortable temperature wise? Did you like the food that we had? Was the instructor engaging? Um, learning, what did you actually learn? Did you actually understand this information? Do you now know have the knowledge and skills? Behavior gets to, did you take the skills and knowledge and start applying them on the job? And then results, what, remember those things back at the analysis phase? Did we impact money saved? Did we impact um, time that it takes? Have we made those organizational uh, results uh, shine that we were trying to address in the, in the beginning? So this is a typical um, Kirkpatrick's evaluation model and you don't always get through all of them. Unfortunately, a lot of organizations stop at reaction or reaction and learning. Um, and so I have some, some tips and some ideas about how to do that. So my, um, before we get to Q&A and discussion, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. What I'm going to propose is let's focus on implementation and let's focus on evaluation next time when we revisit Addy. And let's try to look at finding value in where, what we might be missing. What we might be missing in the um, user and accessibility testing phase of, of implementation the monitoring, governance, badging, and then how we can add value to instructional design through evaluation at the end. So I know this has been a lot, um, but here's, I've got some contact information. That session is going to be held March 11th at 1.30, so I hope you can join us then. Go ahead and register today. I understand it's up and running uh, on the Eventbrite site. And then I'll kind of close and let you guys have some time for Q&A. What's still unclear? What do you need more support or tooling around? How has Addy helped you? Um, and what best practices you can share? So, Vicki? All right, well, I was going to dig out the uh, link to the March session and put it in the chat, but then I ran out of time. Anyway, well, this was like so great because it, you gave us this teeny little tease and then I looked at the clock and I said, oh my gosh, it's an hour and a half already. So uh, this is, you know, the, the teaser and then everything will tie everything all together. I think we've had some really good discussion today and I just, uh, it's time for us to do our reaction buttons one more time, a round of applause for Jennifer, knowledgeable, generous um uh, thoughtful uh encouraging all of the great things that we love in our instructors so i'm going to stop the recording <laughs>